You sang at the Oscars this year in the tribute section to those who've died in the past year in the industry. You sang the Beatles, In My Life. That's a very evocative song. There are places I'll remember all my life, some forever, not for better. Some have gone and some remain. That must have resonated as much for you as for others. It does, you know. I mean, it's, uh, as time goes by, you know, you, you, uh, you start to lose people. Even for me at 62, there are a lot of people who have gone, and there was a lot of high-risk kind of stuff that, uh, that was just part of being in, in show business and uh, in rock and roll when I was younger, and that took a lot of people out. So uh, uh, it is evocative, that song, and it, it's a great... It's funny to think of them writing that song in their sort of mid-twenties, you know. Mm. <laughs> it's great that... The Beatles were in '68. Were at the basically at the height of their, you know, their powers. Uh, Sergeant Pepper's had come out a, a year and a half before. Uh, they were making the White Album, and I was using the same studio they were recording in, using the time they weren't using. Basically, mm. the interstices between their their recording sessions. So I would come in and uh, listen to what they had just cut. Uh, Hey Jude or uh, Rocky Raccoon or, you know, and, and then uh, occasionally, um, uh, you know, Paul or, or uh, George would, would stay on and uh, uh, play on a song of mine or, you know. So what influence, what, what impact did that have on you, do you think? It, it was a validation. Then came Far and Rain with those opening words just yesterday morning, they let me know you were gone. They become so much more haunting when you learn the story behind them. And I know you've spoken about this before, but can you briefly describe the circumstance that led to Fire and Rain? Well, when I was in New York with, uh, with uh, the flying machine for that year, I, I had a, a girlfriend, uh, 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 Susie and I were, uh, were, were really close. And, uh, uh, you know, I went to England and... Um, uh, she committed suicide after a, it, she was having terrible problems with her family. They had committed her, actually, uh, because they wanted to control her, really. It, it wasn't necessary. But they committed her in a, in a state asylum, and, uh, and she, um, uh, she eventually killed herself. So, uh, but you didn't know about it for some months. And, and my, but my friends... Uh, 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 I was recording this album with the Beatles, and they didn't want to burst my bubble. You know, it was just you know, wait. Let's wait until he's got the thing in the can, and then you can, uh, we can let him know about it. And so that's that's the way that first verse happened. You know, the second verse was written in a in a uh, in a recovery place, uh, sort of a rehab for for uh, for a drug a drug rehab place in in Western Massachusetts, very near where I live now, mm. and uh, was a was sort of about that chapter, and then, uh, um, uh, you know, the third one was about sort of a kind of a bleak look at trying to pick up and get started again. You've said about your addiction, the thing about drugs with me is that they were eventually boring, and when they weren't boring it was a humiliating, stupid accident. In the end it was simply too narrow, I felt as though I lived on a postage stamp. If it is that stultifying, why does it take such a grip on people for so long, or indeed until they die? The key for an addict is, is how much of a relief the addict f felt when they first discovered their drug of choice. Uh, when that really works for them, watch out for the, for the back end, because you'll hold on till the very, you know, you'll be the last person to admit that it's, uh, that it's that it's got to go. It's a dead end. It's the same day over and over again, um, and, and increasingly painful. Uh, I watched it take my brother, and uh, I watched it really uh, um, uh, restrict my father's uh, uh, potential and, and uh, really... Uh, so, and, and my particular drug of choice was uh, so illegal and so dangerous that, and also so stultifying, sort of, so so powerful that uh, I, I really, uh, I just needed to have another chapter in my life. At the age of 35, I wasn't ready to, to, to uh, cash it in. You're reluctant to talk about your first wife, Carly Simon, which I'll respect, but, but can we talk for a moment about your music together? 
Because sure. for a time there, you were America's, indeed much of the world's, favourite singer-songwriter couple. Oh, no, I'll, I'm happy to talk about Carly. Mm. Um, so um, how important was that part of your life? It must have been very well, you know, consuming at the time. It was. And, uh, but it was a very public marriage and a very, uh, you know, for me it was just premature. You know, I had no business uh, making that, you know, it amazes me that people get married at the age of, in their 20s at all, you know. I mean, what do you know? Very I, little. Uh, no, it was just, it, it was sort of, it was kind of doomed. I mean, really, it was just, uh, I, I I was unfit to be a, a, a husband and father, and um, we. That's a very of, must be a very tough thing to say and to acknowledge. Yeah, no, it's not hard to say it. It's just patently true. You know? Yeah, and yeah. Well, there's another song from October Road called "My Travelling Star." You wrote presumably about life on tour. That coming back home was like going to jail. The sheets and the blankets and the babies and all. That sentiment didn't stop you doing it all over again, did it? The sheets and the blankets and the baby, quite happily. Well, no. I think uh, when a gentleman uh, becomes involved with a, with, with a woman, the fair sex, um, if she wants to get married, well, you step up to the plate. And now you're back on the road with Carol King. She speaks very fondly of how you coaxed the shy backroom songwriter onto the stage in the Troubadour in LA back in 71 and changed her life. How do you remember that? The, the Troubadour was one of the very first times that she was actually billed as an opening act. But the first time that she stepped up in the context of my set and sang uh, um, Up on the Roof was at Queen's College. And uh, it was, it, she was very tentative and, uh, and but, you know, the, the music uh, takes over and uh, those songs that she wrote are so are such vehicles you just can't lose you know once mm. you once you hook into it it's sort of here, away we go the accolades keep building it's not that long since your last grammy and your induction to the hall of fame as both a singer and a songwriter so you really have had a fortunate life it, it is uh, gratitude is the right attitude and i'll probably end with that platitude <laughs> <laughs> james taylor thanks very much for talking with us Thank you. Thank you, Carrie.